All right, so my talk is on foundations considered useful. Um, many people have talked about their experience becoming a speaker at this event. Um, I just wanted to clip from an email I sent to James last Friday. Um, I think I was one of the very first people who volunteered to be a speaker at this event, and uh, I gave him dutifully, I help organize events, I know how difficult this can be. I dutifully gave him a talk in an abstract, um, which he completely ignored. Not only did he completely ignore it, he didn't tell me he had completely ignored it. Um, I came onto the website last Friday, I sent him this email, he goes, ha 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 ha. <laughs> I did not make this up. This is the record. This did not come out of the fake monk chips Markov chain. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so, um, and apparently I'm combative and funny. Um, so fuck you, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to be channeling George Carlin here a bit. <laughs> All right? I apologize in advance. There will be some rants. Keep up. This is, by the way, what I did want to talk about. It was a talk that I like to do a lot. It's called How Eclipse Works. And if you look up there, you know, we ship on time, okay, on time to the day for eight years in a row. All right? On time to the day for eight years in a row. And we're an open source organization, and we're completely distributed. Right, 400 committers, 49 companies, 18 countries around the world, and we ship on time every day, every year. Uh, sorry, on time every, to the day, every year. Um, that would have been a great talk to come right after Zach, don't you think? <laughs> hey, 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 so. <laughs> All right, so why am I here talking about um, what James wants me to talk about? I'm gonna get that out of the way first. Um, so this all came out of a blog post by a gentleman I've never met. Um, if I say anything mean about him, it's not personal. It's just, you know, is he here? Oh, we should, ah, oh, you and I should go have beers later. Um, Apache considered harmful. Um, fun little, fun talk. Um, of course, I rose to the bait and wrote some, wrote some fairly annoying blog post in return, which I'm pretty sure everybody ignored. Um, and, whoops. And then uh, Steve, -O, Steve -O Grady, the great Steve O'Grady, said, wrote, a, wrote his own blog post, um, which had, this was the money quote right near the end, which I have run through my bullshit filter. Um, <laughs> so if you boil it down, what he said was he totally agrees with, is it, I'm sorry, is it, is it Michael, Mike Al, Mikal? Um, basically totally agrees with the, you know, foundations are useless, but they have a halo effect, so you have to kind of keep them around because people like them. Um, I think that's a little harsh. Um, one of the things I want to get out of the way is that foundations and Git are not mutually exclusive. Um, we love Git at Eclipse, and we've actually made a decision a while ago to move the entire Eclipse community lock, stock, and barrel um, over to Git. Um, up until as recently as 12 months ago, we were basically a 90% uh, plus CVS shop, if you can believe it. Um, I know that sounds disgusting to many of you, but um, I, actually I should ask, uh, how many people here have used Eclipse at some point in your life? All right. How many of you regret that every day out of that time? Yeah, that's, that's okay. We can talk about that sometime too. Um, but the um, part of the reason why CVS worked for Eclipse is the CVS plugin for Eclipse actually works really, really well. Um, so it's, it's been a bit of a, an exercise to take an entire community of, what do we got, 270 projects, uh, just under 1,100 committers, um, and move them over to a completely different uh, version control system. And, and the other thing, I, actually just last week, we uh, finally we got Garrett up and running, so now Garrett is going to become part of the fabric of uh, Eclipse. Uh, if you don't know about it, it's a really, really nice code review tool. Um, does things like we hooked it up to Hudson, or you can do it with Jenkins too, I'm sure. Um, and uh, Hudson says, yeah, this thing actually builds, so you should maybe take it to the next step. Because um, if, you, if your contribution can't build, then it's somewhat less than useful, right? Um, but it's been a big job that we are taking the whole, um, the whole Eclipse community and bringing it over to Git to the point where we've publicly announced 
that on is it December 21st, 2012, the day the end of the world is predicted by the Mayan calendar, we are shutting CVS off at Eclipse.org. <laughs> So, um, why I think foundations are useful. So this is the laundry list of things. Um, governance, IP management, licensing, project infrastructure and forge, e.g. Git comes in handy, project lifecycle, predictability, community oversights, norms, mores, culture, ability to scale, brand value, and neutrality. Okay, so James, now I've done my duty, I can move on. <laughs> so these are the things, these are... <laughs> so every one of these is, is, uh, is a talk in and of itself, um, but a couple of things that I think that, um, that are particularly important that foundations give you, um, brand value is important to customers and it does mean a lot. Um, neutrality is probably the single most important thing of all. Ultimately the reason why a lot of code ends up at places like Apache and Eclipse is not because they have the best source code control system, it is because it is, they are both highly regarded as a vendor neutral, you know, no hidden control points place where you can collaborate together on building code. Um, and that's probably by far and away the biggest single value that, uh, that, that foundations um, bring, to, bring to the open, broader open source community. Which, by the way, governance is hard. Um, uh, John O'Bacon, um, I'm sure um, many of you know, I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, but I loved his book. And if you are at all interested in communities um, and how to run them, how to work with them, I highly recommend reading the book, The Art of Community. Um, one of my favorite quotes from that book is, governance does not suck, to which I say, yeah, but it's really fucking hard. Um, one of the things about, especially at Eclipse, that you have to realize is, so, um, in my, in, in my job is balancing the interests of all of the stakeholders in an organization or a community like Eclipse is, pretty, is a pretty big job, right? We have 175 corporate members, we have a thousand committers who are also members, um, and a lot of projects with very different desires and views and directions, and balancing all that and doing it in a way that's open, transparent, and moves things forward every day um, is, is a lot of work. The other thing that open source foundations bring is part of governance is the three major principles. Um, and one of the things about a lot of the, um, say the GitHub style of approach is that there really isn't any formal notice of meritocracy. That's good and bad. I mean, obviously back to KK's talk, the, you know, the more that you can lower those barriers to entry, the faster you're gonna get people to contribute code. That's the good thing. The, the flip side of that, though, is that if there's no training wheels, what makes you trust that code? Um, and meritocracy is one of the fundamental principles of all of the sort of uh, the major foundations, and I actually think it does have some value. Yes, it can, upon occasion, get in the way of developing code, um, but it does have some merit, no pun intended. Enforcing transparency. Um, is something that uh, foundations do a great job of. Uh, both Apache and Eclipse, I think in particular, um, the, relative, the community spent a lot of time um, taking new projects in and teaching them how to do open source. And probably the hardest thing about doing open source for someone who hasn't done it before is the notion of being completely transparent. Um, we at Eclipse take in lots of projects from companies for which uh, this is their first ever open source project, and I can tell you from lots of experience that teaching folks that have been inside an organization or be behind a firewall, that they need to be completely transparent about not just the code, but all of their conversations, all of their plans, all of their architectures, all of their decisions, that is a big deal. And it takes a lot of work, and the communities really help enforce that. Openness. Um, openness is uh, sometimes confused with transparency, but what it means is you have to be open to all comers. So one of the skill testing questions we ask folks that want to bring projects to Eclipse is, okay, who's your direct competitor? All right, now imagine they put 20 people on that project and outcode your guys. Are you still okay with this? All right? 
Openness means being open to everybody who wants to come in and join in. Foundations have been at the leading edge of open source for a long time, but places like social coding, like GitHub and, and Git in particular, or Git in general, um, have really changed the bar. I used to work for this crazy Canadian guy, uh, Dave Thomas, <clears throat> um, for ten, I worked for him for 10 years, and uh, he worked, we worked in a distributed uh, uh, company long before it was fashionable. Um, this is back as early as the late 80s and in, well into the 90s. And he basically, his, his model was that you could basically explain the emotional state of a developer um, like this. It basically, they oscillate between, leave me alone, I want to be involved, and the job that you've given me is impossible, or the job that you've given me is trivial. And of course, the happy place is where you find developers that are both involved and satisfied that they can ta handle the task at hand. It is hard for an old guy like me, I'm over 50 now, um, I started my first ever professional programmer job at, uh, in 1981 or 82. Um, it's hard for me to explain to you youngins how hard it was back in the day. If you wanted to share a program with a friend, you printed it out and gave it to them like a book, right? That was pretty much state of the art. Actually, in some ways, punch cards were at least ahead of that. Um, but it was, it was really tough. A lot of the tools that we've got these days is really about getting developers into that happy place a lot easier and a lot faster. Coding now is a social activity. Um, it's hard to remember, but at one point it wasn't, and this is a really, really good thing. But one of the things to, to understand is, so everybody here pretty much, I think, um, probably thinks of, or at least a great many of them, think of yourselves as web developers. Um, one of the, the open web concept um, is basically one of the areas where open source has completely won. I don't know if it's, it's, it's even possible to imagine or to explain this. If you could do a time capsule <clears throat> back to somebody from 1980s or even 1990s and explain that we are in the process of building a, the, basically the next generation of application platforms and it's going to be 100% open source and it's going to be 100% um, open. Um, I mean, Flash is dead, Silverlight's dead, uh, browser plugins are dead. This is the way it's going to be, folks. Right? Um, the problem for me, and this is, is that a lot of this stuff is actually kind of boring. Um, it's boring in the sense that open source is so dramatically won that it is the underlying assumption that of everything that happens. Um, it's also a little bit boring because, to be totally blunt, a lot of the, the, tra the, the uh, conversations and activity that happen in the open web space um, is excitement about reinventing the wheel, right? One of the downsides of being in the software industry as long as I have is that you see the same shit done over and over again. And if the new generation would at least have the decency to read the shit that happened before, they might not reinvent everything. It is my opinion that every new software platform, and I see this happening with the open web today, devolves to the point where it re-implements Corba. <laughs> right? I love the idea of server-side JavaScript. I've been saying it for years, long before I'd even heard of Node, that server-side JavaScript was going to happen and it was going to be cool. But for God's sakes, before you re-implement Corba, maybe go back, actually, by the way, Corba was a re-implementation of another thing called DCE, right? If you're old enough to remember those acronyms, right? I can remember reading the SOAP papers in 1999 and going, oh my God, I know where this is going, <laughs> right? So the first time you hear some guy say, you know, Node would be great, and it's really simple, and I love it. All we need is authentication, security, two-phase commit, transaction control, and enterprise integration, right? You know you're doomed, <laughs> right? I, so, but 
if it actually happens and you have to do that, at least for God's sakes, go back and look at the stuff that went before you. Don't. The thing that is really frustrating as an old guy is seeing the amount of technology that is reinvented through incremental rediscovery. Right? It's really annoying when people don't know anything about all the stuff that's happened before and think that it's a completely blank slate and no one could have ever thought about this stuff. So the reason why code comes to foundations is fundamentally because code is not about you. The systems that you're building are not about you. It's about your users. And the reasons why a lot of code ends up in foundations is users want it in foundations. Great examples and some recent examples, some old, some new. I mean, IBM um, created the Eclipse Foundation because their users said IBM's control of Eclipse was not, was not good enough. They needed to be completely independent. Um, just reading this, out this, this morning, actually, that it looks like Red Hat is going to join OpenStack now because now that OpenStack is going into a foundation, they're happier with the governance. WordPress, Drupal, um, PhoneGap going to Apache, these are all examples of where users wanted to see code moved into foundations. So if open source is completely won in the open web, um, What's next? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I didn't, I honestly didn't hear you. I said the closed web, that's what comes next. Closed where? No. Closed web. No, no, that's not going to happen. So a little, a little fact. Um, the amount of software and consumer products is more than doubling every couple of years. The code that goes into cars is now the number one source of innovation in the automotive industry. And that's, by the way, not just the entertainment units, it's the code, the control code that's going into engines and brakes and the like. There's over 20 million lines of code in an S-Class Mercedes. If you look at the, um, the, the line of uh, growth of code in airplanes, for example, um, it's amazing, right? Code runs our lives. There's, uh, I think it was Laura Merling's talk earlier, she was talking about what's gonna be like in 20 years when the machines are running our lives? And the answer was, well, well, we'll all be artisans. I'm actually worried about the machines that are gonna be running our lives. But, so I assume everybody in this room thinks of themselves as a professional developer. Who's ever heard of the Therac 25? Well done, actually. Who, okay, for those who haven't heard of the Therac 25, as I believe, as I understand the story, um, this is generally considered to be the first, design, first device known and documented to have killed people, right? And this story is extremely important to me for a couple of different reasons. One is, this machine was designed and built in Ottawa, my hometown. Um, secondly, uh, when the, at, this thing was uh, operational from 1984 to 1987. Um, in 1987, I was diagnosed with cancer and I spent six intimate weeks on a machine called the Therac 6 that had exactly the same software running in it than this thing had. And the only reason I'm here today is because the older version had hardware overrides. That's it. It was exactly the same code written with exactly the same wildly bogus process that didn't take any of the safety criticality of what was going on into account. So, by the way, the company was almost bankrupted, as you can imagine, um, and, and well-deserved. But it is an example, and by the way, you can Google this thing, it's a fascinating read. If we're gonna have machines running our lives in 20 years, I want, that, I want the code in those machines to be open source. The kinds of things that we're doing at the Eclipse Foundation right now, and I guess I'm getting short on time, here's an example of something that's going on right now. I got one more slide. Airbus wants to develop software and maintain it for on the order of 80 years. 80 years. They've spent years studying this problem. They are convinced the only way they could possibly do this is open source. That is what I think is an interesting problem for a foundation to tackle. Thank you. <laughs>